Eternal Return is deep, complex, and can honestly be overwhelming at times, so that's why I've compiled a list of 10 more things that I wish I had known when I had first gotten into the game. So to kick things off, I want to talk about the most important concept in all of Eternal Return, and of course that is time and opportunity costs. Now what that means is that every single action you take, you're essentially choosing not to do other things with the time spent on the thing that you did choose to do. So for Eternal Return, that means that everything you do in the game is essentially you weighing that choice versus potentially doing other things. So the reason why I wanted to start with this point is because it's one of the most important concepts in the entire game, and it's the main reason why you'll never see people necessarily take fights at level 1 or before they finish their purple weapon. Some things just take too long, and if you're going to be chasing fights before you finish your weapon, or if you're going to be trying to farm animals with just a white weapon, odds are the time it takes for you to actually get that done, other players are going to finish their weapon, they're going to finish even more than that too. They might even get close to full build in the time it takes for you to do something very slow. At the end of the day, this game is just all about time management, and it's up to you as a player to understand what is or isn't a good use of your time. Now the second point on this list is actually just a concept that most people misunderstand fundamentally about the game, and that is in regards to attack clicking. Attack moving in Eternal Return actually targets the closest target to your cursor, it doesn't target the closest target to your character. That being said, currently the game does prioritize cameras, traps, downed players, and animals as equal priority to alive players, so it is possible that you're trying to attack a player and you're going to accidentally A-click a camera or a trap that's nearby. You can even use this to your advantage by surrounding yourself with cameras in an end zone to make it harder for players who rely on attack moving to target you when they're attacking you. Now for number 3, we're going to be talking about attack power and how it influences the power of your skills. Unlike other games you might have played, this game does not have a system where attack power only affects your attacks and spell amp only affects your spells. In this game, the formula for calculating spell damage is a little bit different, and the way it works is that every skill actually has an attack power scaling. If you mouse over any of your offensive skills, you'll likely see a orange number there. That orange number represents the attack power scaling, and you can find the exact values on the Eternal Return wiki. So this sort of is what makes spellcasters in this game different from spellcasters in other games, where attack power actually matters a lot here in benefiting skill damage. This is why you'll often see spellcasters building items such as Rocker's Jacket or Sheath of Shah Jahan, because it actually does still give damage to your skills, despite the fact that it is attack power. Most other games don't have attack power work this way for their skills, but in this game it does. Skill amp ends up influencing the final damage of the skill after all the scalings are applied. It's not quite the same. If you want more information on the damage formula, there is also a formulas page on the Eternal Return wiki, and I'd highly recommend checking that out. Now, one of the more basic points on this list will be number 4, and that is knowing where the final end square is going to be in each zone. I've seen new players struggle with this before. They get to the final zone of the game and they don't understand why they're about to explode to their zone timer, but their opponent doesn't seem to be as well. And that's because the final square in the game that occurs in the final zone will always appear around the console of that zone. So if you're unsure as to where you should go in the final zone as the final zone is about to close, remember that it's always going to be around the console of that zone, which should be marked on the minimap. Coming in at number 5, I want to talk about the importance of farming animals and the loot tables that they can have. Boars, dogs, and bats all drop fairly basic materials. They have a set loot pool of white materials that they can drop, but the most interesting loot tables come in the form of the wolf and the bear loot tables. Wolves and bears have an assortment of insanely valuable items that translate into some of the most powerful gear in the entire game. In addition to getting good mastery from farming these animals, you also get really, really strong materials. And knowing how to adapt your build based on the stuff you get off of wolves and bears as you're farming is what separates good players from great players. For example, if you kill a wolf camp and you happen to pick up an extra mithril, you should consider maybe making some mithril gear to replace a piece in your build. Additionally, if you happen to get a cell phone off of a bear, or electronic parts or blueprints, there's a good chance you could turn that into smart bombs somewhere down the line. Just because this stuff isn't necessarily in your build plan doesn't mean it can't still benefit you in a big way. 
Also, if you're struggling to finish a piece of gear in your build, it's okay to just throw it out the window and just go with something you get off of an animal. If you get an early ruby, maybe you just pick up a fabric armor and make a sunset armor. Now, I do want to talk about for number six, the concept of grouping and when you should group in squads and duos. In these team modes, it's important to group as early as is reasonably possible. Now what this means is that you need to find the right balance between sacrificing build speed with sacrificing safety. An alive but underbuilt teammate is far more valuable to me than someone who greeted for a very dangerous build and got picked off on night one. While there is no perfect answer for when your group should end up grouping, the ideal situation is that you group as soon as possible while you can still maintain a reasonable build route where you can finish good items for your build. Generally, as a rule of thumb, some of the best teams tend to meet around the second or third zone, depending on how fast your first three zones are. But generally speaking, grouping after four zones is just not ideal and is generally too late and you might get picked off by a team that grouped in the second or third zone. Strength in numbers is an absolute huge factor in the early game of squad games and potentially duo games as well. A group of white weapon teammates could definitely just bulldoze one person who happens to already have a blue or purple weapon done already. So just make sure that you're not getting caught out, but also make sure that you're not grouping so early that your team doesn't end up finishing anything and you don't scale into the late game at all. Now let's talk about Wickaline. Number 7 on this list is about Wickaline and the importance of killing Wickaline. Wickaline is the neutral boss monster of Lumia Island, and she always spawns in the same place 10 minutes into the match. You can see a countdown for when she's going to spawn by pressing M and opening up the map. Wickaline is a strange boss monster to fight. She has a rather erratic movement pattern and very strange aggro. The thing that mostly breaks her aggro is if she is taken out of her aggro range, which sets as soon as you attack her. Think, as soon as you aggro her, she is setting an origin point that if she goes far enough away from, she will run back to it. You can aggro Wickaline by attacking her directly or stepping on her poison trail, which also gets her attention. Now you might be asking yourself, why do I want to kill Wickaline? And that's because if you kill Wickaline, you get a handful of things. The first is her item pool, which is a force core, a VF blood sample, and a med kit. These three things are guaranteed to drop every single time, but she also has a fourth slot that generally is occupied by one of the following things. In addition to the loot that she drops, she also grants her killer and her killer's entire team the Vital Force buff which lasts for six whole minutes. The Vital Force buff causes all damage dealt by that player to cause a true damage bleed for a couple of seconds. Now at number 8, let's talk more about where Wick spawns and where she goes. Wickaline always spawns right here in Research Center, right next to the Avenue entrance every single time at 10 minutes into the game. Now where she decides to go is determined by a variety of factors, the most important of which is which zones bordering Research Center are open or closed at the time. If Avenue is open, Wick will always start by going into Avenue first. Assuming that Avenue is closed, Wick will default 90% of the time to going to Cemetery. Now, if Avenue and Cemetery are both closed, there's a very strong chance that Wick will go to Forest through the Research Center. Now, I've been saying chance because honestly, there are a few exceptions to the rule. There are some cases where Wick will actually go through Pond, even if Pond or Avenue are both closed. If she does this, there's a very good chance she will actually go into Cemetery through Pond and Hospital instead of just going through the entrance that's next to the Research Center. If you're having trouble keeping track of where Wickaline is at all, the game actually tells you in chat in-game. The game will notify you whenever she is in a specific zone after a few moments. At number 9, let's talk about one of the most important mechanics in the game, noise. Almost everything you do in Eternal Return does actually ping on the map which other players can see. This is called noise. The point of noise is to pull players together to give them a better idea of where they are without perfectly revealing their location. If you see someone pinging on the map, there's a good chance they're potentially getting into a fight if there's a big cluster of pings, or if they're just a couple sporadic pings, there's a good chance they're just trying to loot in the area or craft gear. When looting a container, crafting gear, or gathering stuff around the map like fish, stones, or branches, you have a roughly a 10-20% to 20 chance of pinging on the map. We don't know what the exact value is, but it's roughly 10-20% to 20 chance. So if you're trying to be stealthy, if you're trying not to make any noise on the map, avoid just gathering things in general, avoid crafting, avoid searching containers, because you will reveal roughly where your location is on the map to nearby players. 
Dealing damage to something does not generate noise on the map, however, a player taking damage does. So if you're attacking an animal or killing animals very quickly before it has a chance to hit you, you will not make any noise. But if the animals do end up hitting you, or if you hit a player, or another player hits you, you will be pinging on the map at the location where the player took damage. So in general, use noise to your advantage. If you're trying to stealth, don't interact with things as you're going through an area. And if you're trying to find players, pay attention to your minimap and chase those pings when you see them. And at number 10, the final point on this list, I want to talk about mastery. Now, mastery is a pretty difficult concept to grasp, and it's a pretty big barrier for entry for most new players, so I'm going to try and make it as simple and easy to understand as possible. What mastery essentially is, is your character's growth as you do pretty much anything in the game. I'm talking moving around the map, crafting something, fighting things, farming animals, attacking players, being attacked by players, taking damage, all that stuff. Basically everything you do in the game can increase one of your mastery levels by a certain amount based on how much you do it. In addition to increasing a stat based on which mastery you end up leveling by doing anything in the game, it will also give you general experience towards your character. To access the mastery menu, when you're in-game, press V and you will see the entire mastery menu, in addition to what level you currently are out of 20 for each one. In this example, we're going to talk about just one mastery, we're going to be talking about health mastery. By mousing over health mastery, you see that you gain a certain amount of experience in the health mastery category for consuming 100 HP, taking 100 damage, and crafting different tiers of food. For each level of health mastery, you're gaining 1.2% max HP, which is a nice little bonus. Now keep in mind, this is happening for basically every single one of your masteries. By leveling them, you're going to be increasing one stat or another in some way. In other examples, if you were to level move mastery, you would get a little bit of movement speed both in and out of combat. If you would increase your hunt mastery, you'd be dealing more damage to animals in the future. Some of these effects range in pretty strange ways, like the craft mastery that actually increases the numbers of every piece of gear that you're wearing, which is why you'll often see CDR builds capping at 35% CDR, knowing that their craft mastery is going to push them to around 37-38% to throughout the game. Now of course, the most important mastery that everyone always talks about is your weapon mastery, and this is one that you should know more than anything else in the game. The reason why weapon mastery is so important is because obviously this is a battle royale where you're fighting people, so gaining additional weapon mastery will make you deal more damage in general, however there is one more thing about it that makes it more important than every other mastery in the game. And of course, I'm talking about your weapon skill. You can't put skill enhancement points into your weapon skill like you can every other skill. You've probably noticed that sometimes you'll just randomly get it regardless of you leveling up, and that's because you gain a point in your weapon skill whenever you hit weapon mastery level 7 and another point at weapon mastery level 14. Your weapon skill is incredibly important for almost every single build, and some builds are actually completely reliant on the weapon skill to be their main source of damage, or at least their main source of making their kit work. Knowing you get your weapon skill at weapon mastery level 7 is very important for evaluating fights in the mid game. Since you can see the weapon mastery level of other players on the leaderboard, if you see that someone in front of you has their weapon mastery level 7 already and you're not quite there yet, you know that they have access to their weapon skill and you don't, and potentially that's a fight you want to avoid. Mastery is one of the core mechanics of the game, but even though it is so important, you don't necessarily have to pay attention to too much past your weapon mastery. Most of these stats and mastery levels will come naturally through just playing the game normally. You don't necessarily have to farm them. And that just about covers the 10 additional tips that I wish I had known when I had first started playing the game. If you found this video useful, if you want to see more videos like this in the future, please continue to support this channel and thank you so much for everybody's support so far. And with that being said, I'll see you guys in the next video.